But I want to tell y'all this morning that God never changes. God never changes. We change and everything in this world changes, but God never changes. There are many things that are changing rapidly all around us. We're living in a constant changing world. And as the years go by, the rate at which the changes occur, they are increasing more and more. Practically every phase of our life changes. Travel has changed. Changed from horse and buggy to Mercedes Benz and Lexus. In our grandparents, uh, great grandparents, time for automobiles and things were not even thought of. We hardly even take notice when a space shell sends someone to space anymore. Political methods have changed from absolute monarchy to d democracy. The entire medical field has changed. That they were once impossible. Now things are routine. As I laid in the hospital, they ran all kind of tests. Well, 10 to 15 minutes later, they'll come back and tell you what they saw on the inside of your body. Uh -huh. But I want to tell you that time changes. Well, but thank God that he changed now. Amen. And he tells us in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. He said, for I am the Lord. He said, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. Now, I like to take my text from the eighth part of that verse. It bears the burden. But God was referring to his own qualities of patience. Y'all don't mind if I take my time, amen? I'm trying to hold this back, but I'm full of joy this morning. I'm like Pastor Wright. God was referring to his own qualities of patience, his long serpent, and his mercy. When he said, I am the Lord, and I change not. The word Lord in our text is the Hebrew word Jehovah. But most of us, we've learned that from Bible study. The names of God, that his name Jehovah means that he is the external, eternal, self-existent, self-sufficient God who created and sustains it all. Y'all bear with me. We're going somewhere with him. He never had a beginning, and he will never have an ending. God has always been, always is. And always will be. Amen. If you understand all of that, then you can explain it to me sometime later. God is more awesome than I'll ever understand. And infinitely more complex than I can ever hope to explore. He transcends all time, all space, all knowledge, and every other dimension that you can come up with. Psalms 102 and 25, uh -huh. it tells us about this, amen? Well, old, of old you laid the foundation of the earth uh -huh. and the heavens of the work of your hand. They will perish, but you will endure. They will all wear out like a garment. You change like raiment and they pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Amen. Thank God that he never changes. Amen. You see, God existed before the heavens and earth was made. Well, and he will exist long after they have been destroyed. Amen. God causes the universe to change. Uh -huh. But in contrast to this change, he is the same. James said that our God is the Father uh -huh. of lights, yeah. with whom is no variation, yeah. neither shadow of turning. Uh -huh. The writer of Hebrews said that Jesus Christ 
He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But Third Avenue, God is unchanging. He is unchanging in his being, in his perfection, and in his purposes. God is the great I am. He is externally perfect in every way. And his purpose will stand forever. What is the great purpose of God, you may ask? I have always said that God's greatest purpose is to seek and to save those who are lost. Amen. But I'm learning otherwise in my study of the scripture, Pastor. Uh -huh. And I'll be sharing that with the, in more detail in another sermon. Yeah. But I believe the Bible teaches us uh -huh. that the chief end of God is to glorify God Amen. and enjoy him forevermore. Certainly our redemption is a part of that great pursuit. But it is only one part and not the whole. God has never changed and he is not going to change. More about that later. Today I want to explore three things and I'm going to take my seat about which God does not change. God is not going to change the way he feels about man. God loves man and he created him to have a relationship with him. He loved the first man, Adam, in the garden before he sinned. And he loved that man after sin entered into the picture. How do I know that? God loves man. The Bible tells me that he does. 1 John 4 and 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God. And knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. And this was manifested. The love of God pours us. Because that God sent his only. Help me Holy Spirit. Begotten son into the world. That we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. God loved man enough to send his one and only son into this world to live and die for him. Or oh, it's in the Bible if you ain't told it out. Romans 5 and 8 says that God loved man enough to send his son into this world to live and die for him. God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank God that he never changes. You ought to be thankful today, church, that God doesn't change the way he feels about you. He loves you. Just as much today as he ever loved you. And no matter what you do, well, you won't, he won't change. Uh -huh, right. You can't make God love you anymore. Amen. And you can't make God love you any less. Now, right. Some of you have wrecked your life with sin uh -huh. and shame. You've thrown away your opportunities. You walked on the grace and mercy of God. Uh -huh. You turn your back on him. And yet he stands there with open arms waiting to receive you to himself. He loves you. I'm talking to somebody in here. But I'm thankful that when I was a teenager, God saw through my stupidity and kept me safe. I'm thankful that when I didn't know what to do, with my life, God was making and molding me into the man I am today. I'm thankful that even today, when I mess up, when my pride gets in the way, when my impatience, the deacon council was saying, when it gets in the way, when I don't love people like I ought to, when I don't take my calling as serious as I ought to. When I neglect his word and his prayer, 
that through it all, God loves me. How can God love me through all of that? How can God love you through all of that? How can God continue to love man when man treats God with such contempt? He can love us this way because he does not change. His mercy endures forever. Not only does God not change the way he feels about man, God is not going to change the way he feels about sin. You'll catch that on the way home. Now as much as people and time change, God doesn't change how he feels about sin. When Adam sinned in the garden, God was offended. Sometimes I think that we look at that incident and we say to ourselves, what's the big deal? He ate a piece of fruit. But it was a big deal, and why? Simply because God told Adam not to do it. Listen, the difference between God being the Lord of your life and you being the Lord of your life is obediency. If God's chief purpose is to glorify himself, then we can rightly reason that our chief person, purpose is to glorify him too. Revelation 4 and 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Somebody read that. For thou hast created all things for thy pleasure, and they are all and or were created. Well, if you never learned anything else from me, well, I hope that you learn that your sole purpose of being on this earth is to bring honor and glory to God, uh -huh. to please him, yeah. to make him happy. Well, but sin does not make him happy. Amen. Your sin is offensive to God. Uh -huh. It repulses him. It is loathsome to him. Now our world, and even you might call sin by some other name. Uh -huh. But let me tell you something. Well, sin is sin. Yeah, right. What was sin 10 years ago well, is still sin today. Yeah. If it was 50 years ago, yeah. it is still sin today. Yeah, yeah. If it was sin in Jesus' day, yeah. it is still sin today. You might change the label on it. Well, you can change the label on pausing. Yeah. But it remains the same. Well, right. Pausing is pausing. Uh -huh. And sin is sin. Yeah. No matter what you call it. You might call it an alternative lifestyle. Oh, no. But the Bible call it homosexuality. Yeah. And it is an abomination to God. Yeah. You might call it cohabitation or experimentation or love but the Bible calls it fornication and it is sin you say you can't help the way you feel about someone when you harbor resentment or bitterness or hatred but the Bible says you are sinning and being unmerciful unloving impatient or hateful. You say you have the parents from hell and you can't obey or honor them. The Bible says that you're a disobedient child. We make some of the sorriest excuses for our sin. As though we got to convince people that, that, that what we are doing is all right. And most of the time, I think we're, we're doing it trying to convince ourselves. But listen, God has never changed the way he feels about sin. And he's not going to change. God is not changing. The cause of sin has never changed. From Adam till today, every one of us has an inherent nature. I didn't become a sinner. I was born a sinner. You were born a sinner. You were born with a sin nature that you inherit 
from Adam. And the only one he can do anything about that sin, nature, is the second Adam, Jesus. Romans 5 and 12 say, wherefore? As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Because of one man's disobedience, we were made sinners. Because of one man's sin, we were all made sinners. You may not like that. You may not agree with how that works. But you don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it. That's just the way it is. And the very fact that you don't agree with the way things are is evidence that you are a sinner. We don't like to admit something is wrong with us. We don't like to admit when we are wrong. But the Bible says that all have sinned. Just as the cause of sin has never changed, the results of sin never change. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. God told Adam that in the day that he ate of the forbidden fruit, that he would surely die. Death simply means separation. And Adam would experience two kinds of death. First, he experienced spiritual death or spiritual separation from God. He hid himself in the garden, hoping that he wouldn't have to face God. He experienced physical death at a very old age as well. But had he never eaten the fruit, he would have lived forever. Listen, the Bible tells us that because of your inherent sin nature, you were born spiritually dead, uh -huh. spiritually separated from God. Well, and only a personal relationship with Jesus Christ uh -huh. can change that. Amen. You can't do anything to prevent the physical death. Uh -huh. We was talking about that this morning. Well, I and Sister Mabel. Uh -huh. Hebrew 9 and 27 uh -huh. tell us it. it is appointed unto men wants to die but after this the judgment thank God that he changes not this is the law of the harvest found in Galatians 6 because of sin we die and if you don't allow Jesus to do something about your sin you'll not only die physically but you'll experience eternal Spiritual death. Well, Eternal separation uh -huh. from God in hell. Well, That's not pretty, church. Uh -huh. Amen. That's not pretty. It's not pleasant. But neither is sin. Uh -huh. and if there's one thing you could count on, God is not going to change. Amen. The way he feels about sin uh -huh. are the results of sin. If God were going to change the way he fell. Uh -huh. If he were going to overlook your sin, somehow he would have done it on that terrible day well, 2,000 years ago Amen. when his only begotten son uh -huh. was crucified. Right. And why was he, God's son, uh -huh. crucified? Well, because God is not going to change his plan of salvation. Amen. There's only one plan of salvation. It's the plan he used in the garden with Adam. It's the plan by which Moses was saved. It's the plan by which Noah was saved. It's the plan by which every man or woman. Salvation is by confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Salvation is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, the men and women who lived before Jesus looked ahead by faith, uh -huh. believing that Jesus would come and be the sacrifice for their sins. Amen. 
And those of us who live afterward look back believing that Jesus did come and die for our sin. Either way, looking forward or looking back, the look is a look of faith. God's plan of salvation has never been complicated. In fact, he made it so easy that most people stumble right over it. I almost always want to explain the following way. And some of you are familiar with, but I want to repeat it again. Again and again and again. Before Adam sinned, he and God enjoyed a wonderful, intimate relationship with each other. But when Adam sinned, he in essence, he turned his back on God. God found Adam at so repulsive that he turned his back on man. Right. They were at enmity with one another. Well, the Bible tells us that no man seeks after God. Yes. And had God never acted, man never would have turned to see, seek out a relationship with God again. Amen. But God, who is rich in mercy, well, he made a way whereby man's relationship to God could be restored. The book of Ephesians tells us that, that when we were far from God, he made peace through Jesus. God and man, so that when we have, what we have now is God turning back to man with outstretched arm, offering a restored relationship. Man stand with his back, turned to a seeking and saving God. I told you this is not a shot message. But this is salvation. This is what we need. Amen. This is what Pastor was talking about when he, when he got up here. Uh -huh. Now, what does man have to do, Reverend Reed, well. to receive what God is offering? Yes. He must turn around uh -huh. and face God. Yes. In other words, man must repent. Well. Turn from that life of independence from God uh -huh. and admit to God that he can't do what he's trying to do on his own. When we turn to God, we are admitting to him and to ourselves that we need help. When we turn to face God in repentance and in confession, we trust him to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Receiving the gift of salvation and eternal life. I like what the mother said this morning. She's been here a long time. And I admit that I've been here for a long time. And when I laid in that hospital and they were trying to find out what's going on. And when I talked to Jesus, he could tell me everything gonna be all right. The doctor come back, he said, I don't see nothing in there. I can't find nothing. I said, no, Dr. Jesus. But you got to know him. You got to confess of your sin. See, we say that we are saved, but how much do you really trust him? Yes. It's just that easy. Well, you don't have to be good. Uh -huh. You don't have to pay up, well, lay anything down, uh -huh. clean up or turn anything over. Well, like the preacher said this past week, uh -huh. when you turn over leaf, you still just got a leaf. Yes. Yeah. That plan of salvation is the only yes. one God will accept. And it's the only one that will work. Uh -huh. If you would be saved, then you must repent of your sin. Well, Confess it to God. Uh -huh. And trust or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And you will be saved. Uh -huh. You don't have to go by that wall and speak through a little old bit of wonder. Yes. And ask him to save you. Well, you got to talk directly to the man. Yes. Thank God that he never changes. Uh -huh. Now, it may not seem a big deal for you to consider the unchangeability of God, but the idea is so foreign to us that we may not realize its significance. But if you stop for a moment, I want you to imagine that would, what it would be like if God could change. When something changes, it either changes for better or for the worse. If God could change to be better, then he was not the best. Yeah, right. And how could God not always be the very best? Uh -huh. 
he will not be God. If God could change for the worse, then what kind of God would he become? Would he become just a little evil rather than holy good? How could you trust a God that could change? But I'm thankful, church, that God loved for me. It never changes. I'm thankful that I have a perfect standard of right and wrong to tell me what sin is today and every day of my life. God doesn't change how he feels about sin. If God changed concerning sin, then he would be an unjust God. But I'm thankful, Pastor, that God's plan of salvation never changes. It is the same today as it was yesterday. And it will remain the same. If God is not the same, if God could possibly change in these things, then my faith in him, it would crumble deep. And he would not be that solid rock upon which we are to build our life. If you experience all of these unchanging characteristics of God before, then you have great reason to praise God today. His work in your life is so wonderfully great. God's magnificent love for you calls him to look upon your sin and to do something about it. And he deserves more than a passing young or a passing interest on Sunday morning. His unchanging nature would cause you to leave from this place rejoicing in the greatness of your God. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice thee because the Lord yes. endured forever. Yes, Rejoice because his name shall endure forever. Right. Rejoice because truth is, his truth endures forever. Free. Rejoice because his mercy uh-huh. endures forever. Yeah, Rejoice because his righteousness endures forever. Yes. His praise endures forever. Uh-huh. His righteous judgment endures forever. Yeah, yeah. His dominion endures forever. Uh Have you ever experienced the great love of Jesus? When men and women fail you and forsake you, Uh you can count on God's love. When you sin and fall short of what God wants you to be, Uh when your life is a mess and you don't have a friend to turn to, Uh you can count on the love of God. God loves you Uh in spite of your sin. Hating the sin, but loving the sinner. Have you ever accepted that love? Have you ever accepted that love of salvation? Have you ever turned to God in repentance and faith? If you haven't, then you need to do it today. Don't leave here without knowing Jesus. Perhaps today you need to move past that first step and father the Lord in baptism or church membership. Maybe the servant that's calling for you. Is he speaking to you about his great desire to enjoy intimacy with him in prayer and Bible study? How will you respond to that invitation today? I'm talking about Jesus. Mary's baby. God's only begotten son. You may have even made some mistake, but that's all right. I got some good news that God, he changes not. He will forgive you no matter what. He will allow you to make you turns in your life. He will give you double for your trouble. He will give peace in the midst of a storm. He will listen to your every humble cry. He will make a way out of no way. He will make a way out of no way. He will show up and he will show out. He will take away all of your sins. He will open doors that no man can shut. He will close no door. He will close doors that no man can open. He will pick you up, turn you around, and place your feet on solid ground. I know all of this is true because of man. And that man's name is Jesus. Mary's baby. He went to a place to die. For our sin, known as the hill of skull. He hung out on that old rugged cross for me and for you. He hung his head 
and died on that dark Friday. Everyone was in a state of mourning. He stayed there all night Friday. All night Saturday night. But early Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, 